and welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with your host, Daniel. And Daniel. Daniel, good afternoon. How's it going? Good. It's We're filming kind of early today. A little bit, not little too, bit. too bad. We're only about 30 minutes or so early. Yeah. This is one of the, the times that I'm going to really encourage our people, like whoever tune in, whoever turns in live, great, you're awesome, as always, like, and anybody else who tunes in live, why you should tune in live is because we're going to be doing some reviews after this episode, which I'm mm-hmm. pretty excited about, and and it's just a good old time. We love having the commentary, we love hearing p- what people's thoughts are, so I just wanted to start off with that because let people know what we're going to be doing after today's episode today, Yep. and uh, why you should like subscribe to us on Twitch, just saying. Starting off with the ads. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, how are Jesus. you doing? Yeah, we've, we, uh, I'm doing better now that Twitch decided to, you know, stop being weird for now. Yes. For now. Yep. So, for what everybody doesn't know, on our live feed, mm-hmm. we got online. I always dr- run in the co- after we get out in for a little bit, because you know how I like to try to run an ad before it happens. Yep. I try to run some ads uh, in the very beginning before we start recording. This way, I make Twitch happy. We mm-hmm. don't have a break in the middle of our recording for the live audience. Yep. And then I ran the ads. No problem. Yeah. And then Twitch decided it was going to run an ad. Okay. All right, fine, whatever. You got Sometimes it glitches out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So we're getting ready to start the recording, and it ran another ad. Yep. So like, four kinda, minutes of ads. Kind of spur of the moment, which is a little weird. Too. Yeah. It was so weird because they're like, okay, I'm ready about to hit the button. You good? We good? All right, cool. Wait, it's running an ad. What the yep. heck is going on? What? You can't run it out at a time like this. We were about ready to start. And I mean, the recording and uh, the audio side and the YouTube side wouldn't have known any difference, but our poor live audience would have been cut away halfway through. Yeah, that's true. So it was, it was it's a bit weird. But welcome back. Thank you. Uh, we had a bit of a weird scheduling because we were told the live audience we were going to record last week but and we're going to miss this week. But it actually turned topsy-turvy on us yes. because of situations. Yeah, I went, like, so I had two weeks off, and I went on three different trips. One, I didn't know until about two days before. <laughs> it was literally, like, when I texted you, I said, hey, so I'm not going to be in town on filming day. I can do a Zoom meeting, and we can film, and you're like, that's stupid. Well, <laughs> Let's not. Kind of, but it was also more along the lines. How are you going to be able to, to do the recording? You're going to be in a hotel room, for one thing. Yep. And you don't know how good the Wi-Fi is there. No. Two... You're going to be with your wife. You're more yep. than likely driving up that day. You're going to want to get food. Yep. And when we normally record is usually when you're probably going to go do stuff with your wife. So I'm like, there's no point. I'll just run online. I ended up doing some work for this specific podcast, as well as I was just doing a live Eschen spiel, uh, noticing the list of games and cool. be like, oh, I've played that. I want to take a look at that and sort of thing like that. So some that was commentary. actually... Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I and I apologize, even though I would have zoomed. It, it, it's okay. You wouldn't have liked it. We we went and had dinner. Um, we went to um, a place called Fogo de Show or something like that. It's a Brazilian steakhouse. I went to a Brazilian steakhouse in um, <laughs> Denver when I was Denver. up there. Oh, wow. They, so they actually have a Fogo de Show in Denver, but we went to a different location because it, it was a higher rated one. Yeah. Oh, man, it was fantastic. Yeah, was it? Yeah, it was downtown Denver, no less. So here's the funny thing. My, my wife, every once in a while, she comes up with some weird sayings, which we've talked about, like, making a game show out of it, which we, we probably will in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it, you've heard the term the meat sweats, right? Like, where, where you have so much meat that you just start, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. a bit. Like, in the middle of dinner, as I'm eating, she's like, are you sweating the meats yet? <laughs> and I was like, okay, hold on. That's not how that works. <laughs> that saying is completely strange. Uh, I get the saying you're trying to say, but are you sweating the meats yet is totally way worse than what it sounded before. So um, that should be the new tagline for her. But was it the answer? What was the answer? I, you know, I'm not, I don't think I've ever been sweating the meats yet. (laughs) Like, is that like, is that like smoking the meats except more moist? Like what? It's it's in a shower room, like instead of a grill, like what? Yeah, I don't how know. How do you sweat the meats? Yeah, but it, it, that's like a hot dog boil, or like you know. Don't ruin Brazilian barbecue for me, all right? Don't do this. Don't do this. They don't flame broil. They just go out there and dunk it in a bucket of boiling water. And no, that's the way you make your hot dogs. Uh, no, I grill no. mine. Oh no, no, I've 
Long, long stop that. <laughs> Never gonna. No, because that's a whole different story with your job. Oh, one of one of our viewers is a massage therapist and said, "Never gonna say that on my job." That that's uh, that's amazing. You should ask one of your. Co- no, ask, dude, no, no, no. There is a Some, fine line no. between a job and a felony. On Sunday, my wife has an appointment with 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 our with with our wonderful creative chaos. So. Ask my the, wife the, at that point. The views of Daniel 2 do not reflect the views <laughs> of the Everyday Board Game Podcast. <laughs> By the way, now that you're nice and relaxed, are you sweating the meats yet? <laughs> uh, with that being said, today's episode is going to be a fun one for everybody here. We are going to be talking about uh, one of my favorite things. It is spooky season right now. This will be dropping in the... Third week of October, so next week actually from live recording. Yep. Um, so it's not as far as ahead as we were for the first two episodes. Sure. Uh, but this was a fun one. It is going to be a return of our compare and contrast. Normally, when we do this, we compare two games that are always compared and give you what we think of each of these games and where they sit. So yep. this way, you have a better understanding of choosing these games. So think of Pandemic and Flashpoint Fire Rescue. We gave you all the word, uh, what mm-hmm. we were thinking about, and it made it uh, much simpler for people to be well-informed of how they like these games. This one, we're doing something a little different. Instead of doing one game, we're doing a mass of games because there is a lot of them out there. This is the Cthulhu Mythos Compare and Contrast. Mm-hmm. Games from Death, uh, Cthulhu Death May Die to Horrified uh, World of Monsters, to uh, some, what's some other ones, uh, Eldritch Horror, Arkham yep. Horror, the L- LCG, uh, games that have a tie-in to Cthulhu, like Smash Up, which has an expansion for it. So Basically, if it has the word horror in it, or of madness. Yeah, uh, yeah. so... The this horror is, of madness. The horror of madness, there you go. So, anything that touches the Cthulhu mythos, we're going to try to um, give you some thoughts on them. Some feelings on them, so we're gonna try. To, we're gonna tweak the compare and contrast. Um, we are going to do it kind of like a board game brainstorm uh, storm in a sense. Sure. We're gonna give you our gamer criteria, which is what we've been using for most of our stuff. We're gonna give recommendations for games that we feel uh, do that best. There could be multiple games uh, that fit the uh, different criteria, so we could give you a list for if you don't want it in game immersion, something that has more meaningful choice. They f- probably fit both in the, those criteria right there. We'll let you know about that. Uh, we also have a short list that I will just explain at the end of the pod, uh, podcast. This way you have more games that if any of these sound intriguing to you, check them out. Cool. But with that being said, what do you think about this topic? So, yeah, this is obviously a new thing, right? Yeah. You were really stoked about it. And no, normally I'm the one who comes up with all the weird, strange, like, different divergence. No, it, it, this is one of those things where it's like it, it was... I, I wasn't quite sure of what I was trying to do here yeah. until, like, eventually after we've argued for, like, multiple hours over it trying to figure out what we're trying. I, I finally got the clarification I need where I'm like, okay, I think I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I made my list. Um, but with that being said, though, I mean, really it depends on the audience. If you guys like this this style of thing, mm-hmm. maybe we'll do more in the future. Let us know what you think in the comments below of whatever platform you're watching this in. Yeah, so, yeah, it's basically just something... We're throwing something at the wall, seeing how it sticks, because there yep. is a plethora of these games, and there's something for everybody. Yep. As you cool. can see, I got a bunch behind me. <laughs> yes, he does. All right, so... Uh, but before we get into that, mm-hmm. Daniel, let's talk about the news first. Okay. Because it's been a long time since we've talked about stuff. Some of these things were, have been on my list for multiple weeks. Yeah, it's been a while. So, so, so we were trying to get this done a couple weeks ago this episode. Just yep. everything that was going on. Couldn't get it done, which is fine. So now, I've been sitting on some news. You've been sitting on some news. Starting yep. with you. Let's go ahead and start. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was something that was never announced or like made available for news but i so happened to be in barnes and noble and i was walking along and i saw this mm-hmm. game mm-hmm. that confused me to say the least not like, that hard it, no but <laughs> this topic confused you. when i brought it up to you you were like wait huh yeah no yeah. that yeah so apparently kurt vonnegut the the author making some pretty wild books who's been dead how many years now for yeah <laughs> just published a board game. Um, I don't know when he died, but uh, Kurt Vonnegut, again, the, the wild author, 
apparently designed a board game called GHQ, or General Headquarters, and he did this many, many years ago, probably, I, I want to say back in the 70s or whatever, mm-hmm. um, if not longer. And it's kind of like an abstract strategy, like like you are moving around pieces, like either naval or air battle or or ground troops or whatever. Like It's not like a war game. It looks like a chess board, and it has pieces that move on this grid, and you're trying to be the one who wins. So it's like an alternate like chess kind of thing or an abstract strategy game. Here's the thing. Apparently when he designed it, he shopped it around a little bit and of course like nobody was really interested in like modern design board games or or anything to that effect and they're probably yeah. like yeah just stick to books anyway you know yeah whatever but he apparently liked it enough where he ended up publishing the rule set along with like um i want to say like in a magazine or some kind of publication that he just po- posted publicly he was like here's the game that i made up and uh yeah have fun and he never saw anything about it. Well, apparently this was discovered later on, and there's a game designer named Jeff Engelstein. I thought it was Engelstein, yeah. Yeah, Jeff Engelstein, who's just an absolute amazing developer, good designer. Um, Head of the uh, Tabletop Designers Association. Yes. Isn't he president? Yep, yep, mm-hmm. exactly. He's, he's a big name in the industry. Well, he found this, and I guess he did some development work to the game, and they published it. And so now, in this wild thing... At Barnes & Noble, that was never announced before, you can get General Headquarters, a game that Kurt Vonnegut made up many, many years ago, now developed, and possibly good. I don't know. Like may, When you're talking about your next piece, I'll see if there's any reviews on it yet, but I doubt... It, it literally just came out like a few weeks ago. So, unbeknownst to any of us. So, yeah, if you like Kurt Vonnegut, I guess that's worth looking into. That, that is interesting. I have seen it in Barnes. Uh, I'm surprised you haven't picked it up yet. I it it's a little pricey mm-hmm. and the back design doesn't look like it's more than just like a few custom wooden pieces for what it looks like. I'm gonna research more into it. I mean, I might just buy it on principle alone. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. So my first bit of news, and this is tells you how long it's been. We've been wanting to record this. I've been yep. sitting on this piece of news, but the international longshoremen uh, they went on strike on October first. I had this news beforehand. Yep. That they were going on strike were because going. we are members of the Gamma Expo, and so they're dealing. They're part of the process. Uh, they were actually one of the struck companies in a sense because they were working with the. I think it's like the LAMX group or whatever. Yeah. That is uh, who the longshoremen struck against. So what would happen there? It basically is the union for the longshoremen of the east coast of the United States, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up the eastern seaboard, all the way up to Maine. Uh, so they went on strike. Luckily enough, a deal was struck for, it was only a few days, so they were able to come to an agreement. There there was warnings that if it lasted two weeks, it could mess up game shipments for months. Yeah. Uh, so glad it got taken care of. They were saying that it probably gaming deliveries would be uh, disrupted. <coughs> For up to quarter one of 2025. Uh, not to mention all the disruptions to consumer goods, to banana shipments, to, yep. shockingly enough, uh, they produce or they uh, import 75% of all bananas in the United States in the East Coast uh, uh, ports. Uh, in fact, we saw it the, re- just recently when we went to Walmart to pick up some bananas. <laughs> there was like a handful left. So it was ridiculous. But Luckily, they came to an agreement. There should be not too much disruption on the flow. So, the International Longshoremen went on strike on October 1st. And about a few days later, they came to a tentative agreement. It's basically they kicked the can down the road to like February before it's fully fledged. So, hopefully, that doesn't lead to any bad issues later down the road. Yeah. Maybe they're the ones who's in charge of our Twitch stream. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We've been having issues for the last two <laughs> weeks. So. so I did just check like while we had some technical issues. So the Kurt Vonnegut game uh, was 1956. Wow. was originally when it came out. Yeah. So anyway, uh, my next piece of news was the new games from the Stefan Feld City Collection were announced. So the new cities that they're going to be. Uh, this is Chichen Itza and Valencia. Or Valencia, sorry. Okay, my question with the Chichen Itza, is it a new game or is it a reprint? That's a great question, and I do not have that information. I'm sure we could Google it. Well, no, I saw bits and pieces of it. Uh, I watched the Dice Tower um, right. thing on it. Yep. It has a cube tower. 
Hmm. So I'm wondering if it's an Amerigo reprint. It might be. I'd believe it. So Queen reprinted their own game. In the, in a city. Well, Amerigo <laughs> is not a city. I know. That's but, why. But Amerigo is a Queen game. But that's if it is. That. I don't know. Like, I would have to see, just because there's a dice or a cube tower doesn't, yeah, I know, mean, I know. doesn't mean it's Amerigo, it, Amerigo right? But yeah, we'd have to see if there's maps that are weirdly put together in strange ways. I remember the Amerigo map. That was the weirdest part during the setup. It was like, yeah, you can't have like like multiple corners have certain things. Mm-hmm. So they're like, if that happens, just rotate tiles and continue doing that until it all works out. It's like, what a weird patch to do it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I digress. So but. yeah, Chichenita, Valencia are going to be the next two ones in the line for the city collection. I think this game makes it game number like. Uh, nine and ten. I, I want to say. I believe it is nine and ten. Yeah, nine and ten in there, and uh, they haven't fulfilled the newest four yet. Yeah, cause I think we're still waiting on seven and eight. Yeah. That yep. that's the ones they haven't fulfilled. The seven and eight. This right. is the next set. We have the first four, which is. Do we have the first six? I don't know. I don't know how many numbers they are. I think we only have the first four. Well, I might be wrong. Because I'm waiting, I'm still waiting on Kathmandu, and I'm still waiting on uh, Masso. Okay. Those are the ones that haven't been fulfilled yet, so we'll see what happens there. Yeah, I don't remember, but either way, we're going to back it. Shut up and take our money. Yep, yep. Uh, so my next bit of news here is actually a, a big <coughs> piece of news that was just announced last Wednesday at the start of Essen. Ooh. And that is Stonemeyer acquiring Takedo from Fun Forge. Yep. Uh, Fun Forge, who has been struggling quite a bit to fulfill their massive Kickstarter, mo- Monumental, uh, one of the expansions and stuff like that to backers, and they've been having a lot of issues on that front. Not to mention they had a long uh, fulfillment process for Najimi. Uh, so, yeah, not surprised they ended up having to, you know, kind of like how Mythic had to take away some of their games to uh, give them to Simon. Yep. Same thing, Fun Forge had to offload some of their evergreens i guess you can say um just to toss them off to someone stone Meyer did acquire takaido but they didn't just acquire takaido they acquired the takaido universe yeah they Tokaido. also get takaido duo and duo. najimi that i just mentioned uh that fun forge was having trouble with uh there are plans for a stone Meyer reprint of all these games not too much difference than what it has um uh, except for one fact that they are going to be adding an atoma um process to it this way yep. you can play it solo it is supposed to be reprinted somewhere around 2025. Uh, other than that, it just says next year. No quarter one, quarter two, or something like that. Realistically, you're looking at maybe quarter one, quarter two, if they yep. want to get it out pretty fast. Another big thing about it, too, is Stone Meyer is being nice, really nice for people who are already owners of Takedo. And they are going to sell the Atoma process for those who already own the game, the Funge Forge version, separately for those who just want to pick it up without having to buy a whole new game. Yep. So that's good on them. Stone Meyer is doing great uh, stuff for their customer service. Cool. And the last piece of news that I had uh, today was the newest games announced, the small box games from uh, All Play, which is pretty exciting because two of them, so there's one called Odd Land, which I don't know much about, and Vegas Strip, which is like a three to six player like bluffing card game. Mm-hmm. Those are cool, right? But, I know which two you're excited for. Yeah, there's two that I'm very spe- specifically excited for, but the first one I'm going to talk about is Money. I have an old version of this game. It was originally from Eagle Griffin. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a Reiner Knizia game where you're using different currencies of different money and trying to get sets of different stuff. Um, super cool. Like it, It's a actually really interesting game. I need to get it to the table again just to see if I want to back the new version. It's your pick this week. Yeah, it is. Oh, wow, it is. I need to start learning some games. And then, uh, but the big one that I'm really excited about is a game called Ruins, which, I mean, obviously you know why I'm excited about it. It's freaking John Declare. In all honesty, I'm not excited about these four packs. The only one I want to get really is Ruins. Money is cool, man. Like, it, it does something that, like, I can appreciate. Like, it's one of those weird things. Like, you remember in Alhambra how you had the four different currencies? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was mm. just... You having some drinking problems over here? Oh my goodness. Alright, I wasn't going to point out how you not made the noise. I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, so, it yeah, it's literally called, called money. money. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're printing money. Literally. No, but um, Ruins, it's a card crafting game. Small box game from John D. Clare. That 
just tells me alone. I already won it. So, Ruins. I'm going to be probably backing it at least for that one. Yeah, yeah, well, for sure, I think I'm going to try to get Ruins. Um, in fact, we, you just got a brand new uh, all-play game. Yeah. You I got did. Lure. Lure, And yeah. all you had to do was feed my dogs. That's right. It was worth it. <laughs> I fed your dogs, you fed my addiction. <laughs> exactly. Either way. All right, so my next piece of news is something I'm actually excited for because it, it, it involves two things I really enjoy. One game that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. It is a reprint of said game in a theme. I adore. And this is Fantasy Realms Reprint. Uh, it, oh, they're cool. turning it into Greek Legends. Uh, it's basically the Greek Mythos games. Cool. They're saying there are going to be some new twists to how you play. Uh, they have Fantasy Realm has had some replint, reprints. You had the Marvel Remix, which I adore. I think that one's fantastic. I actually prefer that one over base Fantasy Realm. Sure. Um, but they also had a Star Trek Fantasy Realm. I atrocious bad don't don't even try it don't like it 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 was too convoluted for what fantasy realms is supposed to be about yeah this one however is supposed to be a lot like fantasy realms with some new twists uh in the greek mythology Mm -hmm. uh the art looks fantastic and apparently there's going to be some new scoring process in this game so i'm intrigued how this is going to work i do like fantasy realms i do like greek mythology this is a home run for me fantasy realms reprint cool your last bit of news. Oh, so I am going to go all four. Okay. Yeah, it's all four news. We have four pieces of news each. Oh, do we? Yeah. I normally do three. Uh, the last piece you always I wanted do to talk four. About, I don't remember. Uh, the last piece of news that I wanted to talk about today is a surprising announcement that came out of the blue here. Mm-hmm. We were talking. So Another we, reason we were like, we've been trying to do this for a while. <laughs> we always like to hear the cheese of like other podcasts and stuff. And norm, if it's bad news, we don't tend to uh, get yeah, involved we, in we it. Yeah, we don't yeah. want to touch it. No. Like, like there's other stuff that I've heard that it's like, eh, and that's not our thing. But... Uh, this news came out of nowhere. Is that Roy Kennedy, one of the main editors and producers on the Dice Managing Tower. editor, I believe. Yeah, managing editor. Yeah, he came on a long, long time ago. He announced that he is leaving the Dice Tower, which is pretty interesting. It didn't say why, um, other than just simply he has, he has new um, opportunities that is expanding. Mm-hmm. And um, the Dice Tower basically made a post just saying that, you know, they... They wish him the best. Like they're they still love in, him. They're yeah, they, they him. love him. You know, it's not. It didn't like the, there was any bad blood no. or anything like that, which is good because then we wouldn't report it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it I seems think it's, like it's just a growth step. Yeah, it's a growth step. It's it, he could either be continuing his like development on games mm-hmm. or designing, or it could also be you know like all sorts of different things that we've heard about him just finding new avenues in the gaming industry. So, yeah. yeah. Wish him the l- best of luck. Not that we have any say in it. He, no- yeah, he doesn't no, know no. he exists. Uh, so. Honestly, uh, I've met him a couple times. He is a very nice guy. Yeah. Uh, he's fun to play with. He's full of energy. I mean, Good. he's he's like you, where to the point where like, I need a break from you, go away. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but he's, him and he, I would get along then. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Except for his taste in games do not match with you. No, they're very different. <laughs> but no, he's a fantastic guy. From everything I've read on what he's doing, he, he wants to open his own game shop. I think that's a big part. He's also got his own YouTube channel, so go check it out. I don't know the name. I don't remember. Uh, if you want to, contact Gamehead Geek. He can tell you the information. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, But that that's what he's trying to do. I know there is some rumors and rumblings that he's got some stuff in the works with other companies, plus stuff he's working with uh, Gary, Gray Fox for his game Last Light. Sure. So that's what I've heard about that, too. Um, so. Cool. Yeah. Good, uh, We're good all for speculating, him. but we hope him the best. Uh, and hope he has a good time uh, doing whatever he finds pleasure with. That's right. And my last bit of news is a bit of a boring business news, but we are a board gaming podcast, so this is information that we like to put out there. Sure. CMON has just lost their chief, 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 chief operating officer, uh, David Prieti. He is resigning after eight years. He started with the company in 2016 as a creative director. Uh, His duties are going to be shared by the CEO and the CFO, if I remember correctly from what I was reading on this. Uh, His main reason for the resignation is other work commitments. Nothing else has been announced by CMON other than this resignation is going on. Um, he's been, he was really known for the restructuring of the distribution model for CMON, basically taking away their warehouse and striking a deal with Asmodee to be their distributor, uh, throughout the world, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and a big thing too, he was the big driving force behind 
some of the new licensing that Simon has, which includes the Ninja Turtles, which includes uh, Marvel, uh, so like the Marvel United and Spin Masters deals and stuff like that. So he is a big part of that, as well as the distribution process. So wishing him the best of luck. Let's see how Simon carries on without him and see what's going on. Cool. So now we're going to be starting our second half, and the main topic of today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Cthulhu Mythos games, and we're going to be doing a compare and contrast, talking about each of our five gamer criteria, and telling you which games we would recommend for that criteria within the Cthulhu Mythos um, universe, like category, whatever you want to call it, Cthulhu games, basically, yeah, um, or anything having to do with Cthulhu. These are the games that we would recommend because of that. I call it the Cthulhu Mythos because they have characters that are not really in the um, the uh, Cthulhu stories themselves. Sure. So like yeah. this, the one thing behind me, the Black Goat of the Wood or something like that, that's not really a Cthulhu right. Mythos character, but yeah. yeah. So I'm just moving this over here for us, just to make it easier on our lives. Yeah. But yeah. How much crossover do you think we're going to have? Oh, we're going to have a lot. Because I think the a lot of the Cthulhu Mythos games that we enjoy are the same in a sense. Yeah, or we enjoy for the same reason. For the same reason. I do have some in here that I got... There's two in here that I haven't played, but I know enough about. And one of them, I didn't get to play, but I talked with the publisher no. and the designer about it at the Gamma Expo that I know enough about it. Okay, cool. And so <laughs> I have two games for each of mine. Um, that I I'll have, be talking about. For I sure. have roughly two or three. The way I wanted to do it is I wanted to give two games mm -hmm. for sure that that are just strictly in their own thing. But I also yes. want to do games that also have really implementations or maybe an expansion or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right, you ready to get into this? Sure. I also just want to let you everybody know I have a short list over here uh, to give a sh talk about that doesn't get talked about in this thing. If you're interested in more Cthulhu Mythos style games. Cool. All right. Flip the coin. All right. We're going to start with our first one, Game Immersion. Immersion. Here we go. Game Immersion, when we're talking about this, is the game fun to lose. Does it have player interaction, whether it's table talk or role-playing your character, and memorable moments? And for me, this was a no-brainer. Um, I forgot to mention about this as well. We talked about it at the top of the podcast, just reiterating. One game can be in multiple categories because it we feel it hits those categories. Mm -hmm. um, this could be one of those games because I think this is a fantastic game. We just recently played it. You finally got to play it. And you actually had fun with it. And this is Cthulhu Death May Die. You mm -hmm. have that game immersion. You really feel that tension sometimes with this game because the dice are not going in your favor. Uh, and a lot of the stuff over there. This game is fun to lose. Uh, and there is those memorable moments, uh, especially how when you for yeah. when you played it and you're you were actually right. doing good on your dice rolls for a change. No, not for a change. I'm <laughs> normally pretty solid. Like you guys, you and Gamehead Geek are like really questionable. Uh, our friend Dammit Dom is normally top notch, and I'm I'm somewhere in between. The last time we played one of those co-op games, I, that was very out of the ordinary. <laughs> that I was rolling incredibly bad, but. I was, like, on top of it with the dice rolls. I, I felt that I was incredibly skilled and talented by how well I was rolling. Unjustly so. Uh, so, yeah, I think this game's fantastic. Yeah. I, I love the minis in this one. They're good. I love the mm -hmm. fact that this is just a Cthulhu Mythos game, but it's only drawing inspiration from the books, but it's doing its own thing. That's one thing I like about it. Eric Lang and Rob Davio, so you're not going to go wrong with either one of those. So yeah, my first one in Game Immersion is Cthulhu Death May Die because it literally hits every single one of the criteria in Game Immersion. Yeah, um, my first one that I wanted to talk about... Or are we going to yeah. say all of them? And yeah, go, go ahead and say your first one. Uh, the first one I want to talk about for sure as far as Game Immersion goes is... Uh, so a big thing about... Uh, before I tell you what it is, a big thing about the Cthulhu Mythos is the characters slowly going insane. <laughs> And I know what this one is. You know what this one is, and I was wondering where there's this is no be. other game <laughs> that does it this well, and it makes the players act like they are just losing themselves. And it's called Mountains of Madness, and it's just a silly like it's not even a party game. It is a cooperative game, a legitimate one. Mm -hmm. But throughout the game, you're going to be getting three different levels of insanity cards. You start at level one, then it upgrades to a level two. And those give you instructions that you must be acting out or performing at all times, but also acting like you're not. So what I mean by that is, like, it might say, 
oh, for, for the rest of the game, you need to stand in the corner of the uh, of the room. For the rest of the but game, you the, can't use your thumbs. Yeah, you can't use your thumbs. Or you have to answer everything in a question. Or you have to talk only in one-syllable words. Or it's just like... And there's a whole bunch of these. And the higher the level, the more like obtrusive to you being able to communicate your information gets and it's hilarious and it's so dumb in all of the funniest ways speaking and of rob davio really well. <laughs> speaking of rob davio <laughs> this is just like and the i feel like this game didn't get enough enough buzz because it has a very serious cover to it it the mm -hmm. game is very different than what you would expect yellow right yellow made it published it and the art is beautiful, but the thing is, like, and it's a cooperative, like, card game. We're trying to get the right resources at the right time. But it really should have been just, like, a much more party or levy, levity game that was just a lot simpler and silly. And they should have taken it with, like, way more cartoony art. So even though the art is beautiful and I like the cover, the cover is beautiful. I, I get that. Because I, I remember the first time I saw this, I thought it was an expansion to one of the other games on this list. I did, too. I absolutely did too. And the thing is, like, only did I, only after hearing about the game did I finally like go, oh, okay, I'll give this thing a second chance because it looks very serious and it's really not serious. So, Mountains of Madness, that's my first one for right. for game immersion. All right. So my next one for game immersion is Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Uh, again, this is another one. This is probably up there as one of my favorite of the Cthulhu Mythos games. This is the second edition uh, by and uh, by and large because of the app integration. Sure. Uh, one, it gives you that really nice immersive soundtrack in the background. Uh, it's basically running the game for you. You just get to play your characters and move things around that yep. is going. You're doing the puzzles on there. Whether the, I believe the first edition was one versus many, where the, the one was the, the game master in a sense, and he's setting up the board and getting make running that drive. This time it's the app doing it, and everybody can work together and make it fully co-op. I like that one. This game is fun to lose. I love the different scenarios. And the reason why I like this one, as well as Cthulhu Death May Die, it's not campaign style, so it's just a plug and play. It's like, okay, yeah. I did this story. This is really cool. I don't want to play Cthulhu in this story again. Let me see what this character, uh, this uh, Elder One, does really well in this story. So yeah. I can play the same scenario with a different Elder One and have different outcomes. I like that aspect. And the same thing is in Mansions of Madness, too, because you can pick and choose what monsters you want to go through, mm -hmm. or you do the scenario, and it tells you, okay, you need these monsters, they do this, you got to do this, and there's different goals as you're playing through the different scenarios. Uh, I also like the fact that what this one does, it also gives you a rating system. So if you want to play a longer game, here you go. If you want to play a short game, here you go. If you want to play a harder game, here you go. If you want to play an easy game, here you go. It's a pick and pull. You pull out what you need, what it tells you to get out. Fantastic. It hits a lot of the criteria. It is fun to lose. There's a lot of player interaction because it's that one thing. It's like, why are you going over there? Don't open that door. There's Something's going to pop out over there. No, we yep. need to go over here because we're searching for something over there. Don't go through that. You open the door. Why'd you open that door? Why'd you open the door? <laughs> and it Don't gives you all that. that sort of stuff. So I like that aspect of it. So Mansions of Madness, second edition. So, um, again, I'm going to go with the the crazy theme or the insanity theme because one of the funniest things in, in game immersion is those stand-up moments and a game doesn't necessarily have to be functionally good to to have those like really exciting moments so my game is like a press your luck game except it's mixed with kerplunk this is from I, I thought it was smirk and dagger yeah towers of madness this is so good so i have mountains of madness and towers of madness probably the two least serious games are in my game immersion that's because it, in Towers of Madness, you have this. You have this. Uh, Are they fun to lose? Oh, they're very fun to lose. Like it's it's hilarious because one of the best parts about this is that um, certain tasks, like what you're trying to do, is you're basically trying to roll five dice. You have to get a one, a two, and a three, and then your other two dice you would simply add together to try and beat the higher score from a previous player. So if I have a one, two, three, five, and five then I, my score is 10 for the two remaining dice. Mm -hmm. He would have to roll, in order to beat my score, a 1, 2, 3, and either a 5 and a 6 or a 6 and a 6. You know, 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. So we keep going that around to see who gets the card for the pass. However, if somebody busts and doesn't get the 1, 2, and 3, instead they have to pull one of the tentacles from the tower, which may cause marbles to drop. 
Here's why that matters. You will be suffering damage, and you will be losing your sanity, depending on certain marbles that come out. And there's three marbles in there that might cause the end of the world. Which is hilarious. I still have to play this one. If if you haven't played it, Mm -hmm. oh, it's funny. Because the thing is, if those three marbles come out, and nobody's won yet, everybody's dead, right? (laughs) However, if you suffer too much damage... Then, or if you if you lose too much sanity, then instead you become a cultist, and your goal is to end the world. In which case, you have a different end goal condition. And every player has their own special ability on top of that. But it's just a, it's just a cool press your like dice game with really silly components, really good quality components, honestly, and just a hilarious idea. It's so dumb, but it's so such a riot. Maybe I should bring it soon. Every time we film a podcast, I always have one game where I'm like, man, I need to bring this, yep. I need to bring this one, and I always forget it when it's my pick. And it's your pick this week, so you're going to forget. And I guarantee I'm going to forget <laughs> it. <laughs> you go. All right, so finally, my last one that I have in here, like I said, I'm going to try to do some that have re-implementation aspects of it. Okay. And so the one I'm going to talk about real quick is one you can see behind me, behind the Cup of Doom that's sitting over there, uh, and that is Horrified World of Monsters. Uh, this has a Cthulhu aspect. The first one that has its own little sideboard in Horrified. And the reason why I wanted to do it here as well is because the Horrified in itself is a, good, a fun game to lose. Uh, there is good player interaction because you're working as a team. As you're, you're trying to defeat the big bad. It does lead to memorable moments when you're like, all right, we did this, we did that. Oh my god, this is what happens. Mm-hmm. It's not as good as some of the other Horrifieds, but it's up there. This is probably my second or third favorite of the four Horrifieds. And and that's because I like the Greek monsters and what they do. This plays off the Greek monsters a lot more than it does the other Horrifieds. But this does have a Cthulhu aspect on it. And by the way, that is by far the toughest monster I've played in all four Horrified games. I thought it was Bigfoot for the longest time. It is Cthulhu. Cthulhu He destroyed us. Yeah. But yeah, and that is Horrified World of Monsters. Cool. With that being said, that's all our game immersion. Yep, so any of those four games you can pick and you'll probably... Or is it five games? I did. Yeah, it's five. Five. So any of those five games you should get, a, you know, an immersive experience with mm-hmm. those. Cool. Exactly. All right, next one up is Art and Production. And what Art and Production means is quite simply, you know, how beautifully the art is made um, or how thematic it is. The pieces and components and anything that's involved with it. Everything from the box insert to apps or extra stuff. And finally, the graphic design. How easy is it to use functionally and helpful for people who are like colorblind and whatnot. So the two I picked, uh, I'll start with Mansions of Madness as well. For the same reason you did. Um, even though I like the scenarios, I like that. I don't think it's tactically as, or tactfully as strong or as rich of a game. But the way that they incorporate the puzzles into the app and the app development, yeah. and on top of that, they have a box full of miniatures for it. Like, too, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's a really high quality production. The only bad part is, is the standees or the stands that have the monster tokens that slide in, and you can only see like a little tiny number if you're at the right angle. Uh, yeah, so it's, that was that was the reason why I did not put it in our yeah. production because that that to me is like the biggest knock of the game. It's very egregious, yes. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I mean, everything else, the app integration, I think, is Fantastic. enough to justify. Having to deal with those. No, no, I don't disagree with you. I like the game a lot. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I put it in my game immersion aspect of it. Yep. But yeah, no, I don't disagree. Is that it? For that uh, one? That's my first one. All right, my first one here is, and again, I have three for this one, is one the one that I was telling you about. I don't I haven't played it. I got little bits and pieces of it, how to play it from the designer and the publisher. Uh, this was recently on GameFound. We saw it at the Gamma Expo. Uh, me and Dammit Dom were very interested in this game. This has some of the best components I've ever seen in a game. This is horror on the Orient Express. It is not out oh, right yeah. now. I haven't seen that yet. But I think it's on uh, GameFound Pledge Manager, so you yeah. can jump in on it if you want to back it as a late pledge. Uh, but this is a deduction game where you're on the Orient Express and something happens and you're trying to deduce as a group who the cultists are and stop the ritual before that takes the Orient ex- or Orient yeah Orient there you go the Orient Express into that's a very different kind of the train. <laughs> the other realms and stuff like that so you're working as a group trying to determine who the um, the bad guys are the cultists in this sense 
Uh, and so you're asking questions, you're trying to deduce who are the members of the cult that are working for the certain old one that you're going up against. It has a 3D train and you're going through the board. Think, um, what is that one game that Spiel does? Cult Shark? Express. Cult Express. Mm -hmm. Except for it doesn't have the roof, so you don't have to worry about your fat fingers knocking things over. <laughs> so you can move things around. It is looks really, really good. The gameplay is a little bit longer, but a lot of these Cthulhu games are going to be longer games. But it seems very thematic. And like, like I said, it's a 3D train. And if you need to, go to, like I said, go to GameFound and check it out. It the, the 3D train looks fantastic. Cool. The next one I wanted to pick is, uh, is one that, uh, full disclosure, this is from Thing 12 Games, and they publish um, one, soon to be two of my games. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind when I praise this game. But this is not one that I had any involvement in. This is called Seals of Cthulhu. And that's because this game is a micro game. It actually only has like 12 to 18 cards in it. And this game... But I was just going to send a link. Go ahead, talk about it. Oh, okay. Um, this game... That's ridiculous. Is is the most overproduced, beautifully micro game I've seen in a long time. Like I said, 18 cards. They're all tarot size. Uh, each card makes up like half of an image that you can kind of play. And you're trying to gain the full image on both sides. And basically it's numbered 1 through 6. You both choose a number. Whoever plays a higher number takes both the cards. If you play... Like the same number, you both you each get your own, something like that. But if you complete these sets of pages, you gain like special bonuses by doing so. It's a super strategic little game, but I mean, God, the production is amazing. It comes in, there's a bunch of cool artifacts and different pieces in it. It comes in this beautiful like velvet bag that's in it. There is hidden items somewhere on various parts of the boxes. Like, everything is thematically made. It's a magnetic box. It has a plastic oversleeve that looks like it's chained in and shackled in. It looks like it's an old book cover with, like, a linen finish. It's all torn up. It's just so, so cool. Now, like I said, again, my game matches that I've designed is the second in the in the Cthulhu, the Cthulhu, the yeah. Cthulhu series, whatever. I um, I forget what, their, what the name is off the top of my head. But, so it is the second in that series, um, Ancient Artifact series. That's it. Yeah. Um, but so I am obviously biased because of that, but I do really think this production is one of the most beautiful things. And they've had some foil cards in various parts too, mm -hmm. that just make it even over time. Like it's 18 cards shouldn't be this beautiful. Like it, it's really cool. Have it you looks seen really nice. this? Yeah. Like, no, I was there when you bought it. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. It's such a good production. Yeah. So art production, I had to go with that and it's just, it's so phenomenal. All right, so my next game I'm going to talk about is another one that I haven't played. I've seen bits and pieces of it. Our friend Game Head Geek does own it. He's been wanting to get it played. It is a re-implementation of a game that's already been out uh, from Fantasy Flight Games. This is Unfathomable uh, from yeah. Fantasy Flight Games. This game looks really good. The pieces and components from what I've seen of it and touched um, are really nice. It is a... Somewhat social deduction, hidden trader. Yeah. You're basically trying to find out who the cultist is. It's based you. off of Battlestar Galactica. Um, Battlestar Galactica yeah. So you're basically trying to find the Cylons of uh, the Cthulhu mythos gotcha. <laughs> in this game. It looks really interesting. It looks really cool. Uh, but I did want to mention it because I haven't played it, but it looks really neat. And I think if you're into Battlestar Galactica, but you weren't able to find it, uh, this is a re-implementation of that game. So you can check it out. It is in the Cthulhu Mythos. So if you're a fan of that as well, or that style of game, check it out. Um, I have one more uh, that I added real quick to this because I think it has some of the best art out of all the Cthulhu Mythos game. It's a small little quick game. This, is, I believe it's only two players at that. And this is Tides, Tides of Madness. Madness. Yeah. Uh, it's a push and pull game where you're trying to collect cards without going insane. And the artwork on this game is through. It's the really world. nice. It is beautiful. I had forgotten about this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so it is a re implementation of ti Time of Time. Or Tides, Tides of, of Time. time. Yep. Uh, but this one is you're trying not to go mad while still scoring as many points as you can, outscoring the other player without going mad. So I like this game a lot. It looks really good. I've only played it a handful of times, but it, it is a fun game. Cool. All right, let's move on now to Meaningful Choice. And this one is impacting on other players, the depth, strategy, tactics, or skills, 
or do arbitrary choices or AP make an impact on the gameplay? And this one, I had to go with my favorite Cthulhu game on this list. Uh, this is where your meaningful choices in used, and this is Arkham Horror LCG. Uh, I do really love this game. I think it's a fantastic game. You are getting a lot of uh, impacting on strategies, especially if you're playing a two-player, or three-player, four-player, depending on how long you want to do. I prefer at two, even more likely solo. Mm -hmm. This is how I run a solo game. But you are impacting other player strategies because you have to work together to be successful. But no matter what, whether you're successful or not, the story moves on. Uh, you, If you win or fail, you move on with this one. This also could have been an art production because the art is fantastic in this game. I like the fact that it's multi-use cards. So mm -hmm. I'm using the cards either as the item that they are or a skill or I can use them to help me with a skill check by adding bonuses and saying, okay, yep. I do this. I love the fact that it's a bag pull game. So you're pulling stuff out of there to see if you succeed on the check rather than rolling a dice. Mm -hmm. uh, so this tells you, oh yeah, that's successful. Or nope, you failed by two or one. Or this is a cultist. So you, you technically win, but it's cultist does something bad as well. So it does certain things. Uh, it's different scenarios. I'm in the second legacy right now, the second campaign, Dunwich Legacy. I really enjoy the mess out of this game. I think this is a smart system. They've done really well. Uh, and I like. I still think this highly more than Marvel Champions. I think uh, as I play it more, as I go through more of this legacy, I think Marvel Champions was getting up there. It was higher in my top 100 last time. I don't think it's going to stay higher now because I, I really do dig this game. Cool. Uh, the first one I wanted to talk about was, uh, I'm a big fan of the Pandemic system, so a Cthulhu version of Pandemic. I was skeptical at first, but when I s played Reign of Cthulhu, which is a Pandemic game mm -hmm. um, that is Cthulhu-themed, <laughs> I was skeptical because yeah. they took out the four different colors of diseases and said just put cultists. There's no specific number. Um, it's also a smaller board. There's like half as many spaces as like the world map. Yeah. And it's like four different main regions and stuff. But you're effectively just trying to play Pandemic and rid them of... The, in Arca Horror by getting rid of the cult. In Horror. <laughs> and by closing up the gates. And that's how you win is by closing up the gates and to getting rid of the monsters if you need to. Um, it works really well. It's, already, it's a Pandemic system and it's pretty true to the Pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I like how simple it is. And the the fact that they changed it from four different colors of sets that you're trying to do into two to, or one single color, which is the cultists themselves, that was a really cool implementation of it. That works really well. Have you played this one? Yeah, it was yeah. actually it was the third game I was going to talk about because I tried to do like the reimplementation games. This was yeah. going to be the one that I was going to talk about. So yeah. I don't have to talk about it now. Nope, <laughs> no brain of Cthulhu because I own this still, and uh, yeah, I probably should get it to the table pretty soon. Yeah, I want to get this played again. I haven't played this one in ages, but I remember this one more so yeah. than some of the other smaller pandemics that I've played. Yeah. Because it does give you that feel like, okay, I'm doing the smart pandemic system, but I do feel that tension because right. these cultists are just going, they're running amok. And it's like, okay, I got to close that gate, but we got too many cultists coming over here. And then there's a monster over there. Yeah. So it's like, oh, God, what are we doing on this one? So, yeah, I, I like this one a lot. Yep. All right, so the next game I'm going to talk about, and apparently it's going to be my final game because you picked one of my games, so good on you. Uh, it's one that you can't stand, but I think it's it's a smart game. Uh, I don't play it as often. I pretty much oh, own yeah. Bring everything. Oh, yeah, up when you're done with this one. <laughs> I pretty much own everything for this game. This is Eldritch Horror. Uh, this could also be Arkham Horror if you want to, whether it's the first or second edition. Third edition changes things up, so I don't know if it really counts. But Eldritch Horror, you're going across the world. You're trying to stop a big bad from coming in. Uh, my issue with this one, it got really big on the bloat side when it comes to all the expansions and stuff like that. Yeah, he is not a fan of this one, uh, as you can see by the, the video it is a fun game. There, it's a, it's lucky. So when we come into the ease of play about the or not the meaningful choice with the arbitrary choices with the dice rolling, there is enough mitigation in there because you can get successes earlier if you're blessed. But it also makes it worse for you if you get cursed. I love that little aspect of it. Um, you do impact other player strategy because you have to work together as a team. And it, it it's a smart system. It's a smart game. I love the the having to deal the mythos cards and depending on where you're at something different is going to happen to you i like that aspect of it it's a smart system 
He just doesn't have taste. So, Elder Tor. This is very much how it stays its welcome for far too much random. Now, if you, I'm, I'm okay with you putting it in... Wait, you put this in Meaningful Choice? Oh my god, no. Yeah. Game immersion, maybe. No, there, there, there's a lot. Art production, maybe. You've played this no, one this is, time. And this was the one of the least... This is the most random game. And I One of the most random I've ever played. There is a Everything lot of mitigation. Is so you just reliant sucked on at this duck, game. On the dice. There is a lot of mitigation so that you can do. There is no way I could have played that better in one. No way. You could have played it better. You could have rolled better. Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> Four hours of rolling a dice badly. Ooh, that's a fun experience. All right, anyway. I already brought up uh, Pandemic, Reign of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I had to pick the game that was inspired by Pandemic. And the, you already brought it up. Horrified World of Monsters. Mm -hmm. This is my meaningful choice. And... Again, it uses a similar system to Pandemic, but the fact that since each monster is different really brings out the flavor of it. Mm -hmm. And I love the meaningful choice, especially with Cthulhu. Man, he's so tough. He is rough, uh, man. I, I agree with 100% of what you said, but <laughs> man, like those choices. It, it's a, he is a tough guy to beat. He is a tough... And, and the thing about it, too, is that when I played it, we were playing it on easy mode, just the two monsters, because oh, we wanted sure. to see how Cthulhu worked, because we yeah. knew he was going to be a tough one. We still got our butts handed to us because we couldn't even beat the other monster because he was spanking us. <laughs> it's like, we have to go solo against Cthulhu yeah. in this one. We we played it in normal mode, but we were okay if we got past the just the second stage of, of Cthulhu. We didn't even get past the first stage of Cthulhu. We beat we the other two monsters. We just didn't get to that part. We were trying to... Uh, I think the problem with us when we played it is uh, we played against the monster that top decks. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't Cthulhu. I forget who the other monster was. I think it was the the Shinxi. No, it wasn't the Shinxi. It was the Sphinx. I think it's whichever oh, yeah. one is. Um, um, if you fell, if they roll their exclamation point, it just drops the card off the top yeah, of the deck. Yeah, it's so. And weird. so we got top decked as well as dealing with Cthulhu. So it was rough. Oh yeah, I'm not biting my tongue anymore. I I, <laughs> I was doing good until he brought up the no taste comment. Then all bets are off. That's because he bit his tongue. He doesn't have taste. <laughs> that was pretty good. Anyway. All right, moving yeah. on to the ease of play. Ease of play. Here we go. And I'll be starting this one off. So ease of play talks firstly about the simplicity and familiarity of the mechanisms that you're going to be using. It also talks about the likelihood to get it to the table. Sometimes that's thematically or sometimes it's because you're familiar with the idea. And uh, is it easy to understand, learn, and teach? Pretty straightforward. So the first one I wanted to pick is another micro game, um, which I 100% think that this makes perfect sense for this. This is Lovecraft Letter, um, you know, based off of Love Letter. It is a remake into the Lovecraft universe, but there is times where, depending on which characters you play, uh, so the basic of Love of uh, Love Letter. Before I explain Lovecraft Letter. Love letter, the way it works, is pretty simple. You either, at the end of the round, want to have the highest number, um, which would be the princess if it if you have the princess, otherwise whatever the closest number to the princess is, or use the cards throughout the turns to eliminate the other players and be the last person standing, in which case you will have the highest number. Mm -hmm. So the Cthulhu version does the same thing, except when you win a round, you might be able to win with a madness token, or you might be able to win with a a sanity token and these tokens are double-sided and you get them depending on how, which card you won with and the reason all that matters is because it, it's a lot easier to win if you're insane because once you become insane the cards are way more powerful so you have to win more rounds in order to win the game but until that point you can potentially just win fewer rounds and win well with the sanity and it works really well so Lovecraft Letter, and it's a beautiful production, by the way. It was in the premium box, and really nice. I, I've had it for a long time. I recommend this one a lot. All right, so the first game I'm going to talk about in Ease of Play is by far the easiest Cthulhu Mythos game out there. Second easiest. My, the one I'm oh, about yeah, to yeah, say is the yeah, easiest. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, that is true. Uh, oh, wait. The one I'm about to say is the easiest one. I think this is the easiest one, in all honesty. Okay. And this is Elder Sign. Okay. 
Uh, that is my first pick. It's basically Yahtzee in the box. You're just rolling some dice and trying to match up certain segments to fight certain monsters to get enough Elder Signs to defeat the before the old one comes in. Uh, it is well produced for one thing. It is a still a go-to game to this day for me for Halloween because uh, it's so simple. It's like, you like Yahtzee? All right. This is Cthulhu Mythos, this is horror themed. You're basically just trying to take your character over there to match these symbols. Uh, and so I like everything about this game. Um, through And then the artwork is fantastic. It Again, the simplicity with the mechanism. Everybody understands Yahtzee's matched eye faces to what the symbols are. Uh, this one is one of the easiest games I can get to the table. I just describe mm -hmm. it like that. It's Yahtzee with Cthulhu and everybody's like, okay, sure, we'll play that. Sure, why not? It's easy to teach, it's easy to learn, it's easy to understand. Uh, the only tough part about this game is that it bloats in time uh, the more players you get in this game. So yes. if you play at a full player count, it's going to take a long time. But it is a, And it's going to be a long time between turns. I really do like this at four players. I think it sings at four players because everybody gets to go before a mythos phase happens. Mm -hmm. Uh and so I like that aspect of this game. Sometimes the Mythos phase is going to move faster because of what the card's drawn on there. But I think Elder Science is easily, for me, one of the most easy of the Cthulhu Mythos games. Okay. So the easiest Cthulhu Mythos game is Unspeakable Words. Uh, I mean, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. You literally make a word and roll a die. And that's why I put it on Ease of Play. Because it... And this is why it's Cthulhu themed. It's, at first, you're like, that's just like Scrabble or whatever. No, no, there's a little bit more to it because it makes it silly. So the idea of unspeakable words is that you are in the Cthulhu universe and you're trying not to go insane, because you want to have the most points, either I think or a certain one to hit like a hundred points or to have like the highest score when everyone else goes insane or whatever. Because the way it works is pretty simple. You have these little uh, Cthulhu tokens that are your sanity markers, and if you have to get rid of them, then then uh, you're slowly going more insane. And on your turn, you make a word, and it's worth a number of points. Specifically, um, for every right angle that's in the letter is how many points that letter is worth, which is kind of weird. So like a like a, a V is just one point, right? An O is nothing, right? And so there's no right angles in an O. There's no right angles in a... In a V? In a V. Yeah. I thought right angles are 90 degrees. Corners. <laughs> Corners. Sorry. All right. You have a good one, e Crate. Either way. Yeah, I have a good one, Crate. Um, but the way it works, though, is that you play a certain, a certain word, and you say that word out loud, and uh, you have to follow pretty much standard Scrabble rules, you know, noun in English, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Then you roll a die... A 20-sided mm -hmm. die to check your sanity. If you roll equal to or less than the number of points you would score, you still score them but lose the sanity. So you want to play a really high-valued word, but at the same time, that makes it very risky for you to not la outlast everybody. But here's the best part about the game, and this is what makes it Cthulhu and even better. When you're down to one sanity, you have gone insane... And you can make up whatever word you want, because you're speaking in tongues at that point. You can lay down whatever letters you want to make up your word. You just have to, per like, sound it out and, and, like, speak it. Like, so you might go, and then still <laughs> roll for sanity. It's hilarious. It's such a dumb twist, and I love stuff like that. So, Elder Sign, or, um, Elder Sign. Uh, unspeakable words. That's that. That's ease of play. It's so simple. Never They're, played it. Yeah, it's dude. It's so stupid and so fun. It's the right kind of stupid. Speaking so. about the right kind of stupid, the next game on my list is one you've already mentioned, and this is Mountains of Madness. Yeah. <laughs> this is. It is a very simple game as you're playing. Leading to some of the most fun shenanigans you're ever yeah. going to play in a game. Because it's literally, you're just trying to reach the, the summit of the mountain, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then get on the plane and then... And leave. And leave, yeah. Yeah, so that's the whole purpose of the game. But slowly and surely, as you're getting along that aspect, you're going more and more mad. 
I can't use my thumbs. I got to go sit in the corner. I can't use a certain consonant or a certain word, that, those kind of things. So mm -hmm. yeah, I can't hold uh, my cards a certain way or I can't keep my cards in the same hand. So it's like, I got to use these like this. You need to respond, I disagree to every, every other sentence. Yeah, so it has a lot of fan, uh, fantasticness to itself, which makes it really one of the easier games to get to the table. It did mm -hmm. itself injustice the way they they sold it as. Yeah. They should have done it as the party game of madness is the, the tagline that should have happened because it is what it is at its core. It's yep. a party game. Yep. That's how I describe it. That's how I think it should be described as. It's a very simple game, like I said. Uh, and when you describe it like that, it is a party game of madness. You're, everybody is slowly going mad uh, and have to do st certain things in certain ways. People always go, go on. And play more into it. A lot of people are not fans of the Cthulhu mythos by themselves. But when you're talking about something like this where, oh, you can't use your thumb. So you got to hold your cards like this or like this or hold them flat, but you can't let other people see them. So that kind of thing. And so you see, like, this goes down really well in the shop. I remember the first time you showed this in the shop and someone had to go sit in the corner and it was like playing the game with us and have to come over and do what stuff they need to do on the board and then go back to the corner <laughs> So that lends itself to that that kind of shenaniganess. It, this is easily by far, and the reason why I put in ease of play is something you can play in a shop. It is something you can play at conventions. It is one of those things that can get big groups in play. So yeah, ease of play, mountains of madness. Cool. All right, and now I that's it for me for All ease right, of play. So I got one more. Uh, I pulled it up just to kind of remember it a little bit because I put it on the list and haven't looked at it since. Yeah, but this one this is uh, a re-implementation of Star Realms, and this came from Tasty Menstrual Games. This is Cthulhu Realms, and it's literally, instead of trying to drop your health points, you're trying to make your other opponent go more and more insane as you're playing. So you're playing cards out to either collect cards into your deck, or you're trying to attack them to lower their sanity while healing yourself and raising your sanity. So... There are artifacts in here, and you're just going through that, and the game will end once the deck runs out if someone hasn't gone completely insane. So it's literally Star Realms, mm -hmm. but with the Cthulhu thing on here. And the artwork is fantastic in this game. I, I do love the artwork in here, too. It is like that cartoony, Godzilla-looking cartoon yeah. art. So, But yeah, Cthulhu Realms and Ease of Play. Cool. All right, and now we're going to be going into our final category, which is Replay Value. And so Replay Value talks about the length of time, like how it scales per player, or like for the player count. Mm -hmm. It also talks about um, minimum number of games for the full experience. And it also talks about the number of expansions it has, whether it's confirmed expansions or speculated, but in the works kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the first game I picked in this was obvious. You brought this up earlier for um, ease of play. I think this makes more sense for replay value. I don't think it's the easiest game to play, but Elder Sign is certainly not a complicated game. But the amount of replay value that's in it, the base game alone has a number of different, um, uh, like, Elder Gods that you can play against. And different characters other, to play as. Uh, yeah, different characters to play as. The, the locations that come out are totally different every time. The monster tokens come out every time. So already in the base game alone, it's, it's an incredible feat how much modularity there, excuse me, there is. Plus, it plays up to eight players, which is crazy. I wouldn't play it at eight players, but it can. And then it has a number, a number of different expansions. It's cool. The expansion's it, fine. Don't play it at eight players. Do not play it at no, eight I'm players. No, I'm saying it, it's possible, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's so much replay value that you have in just that just the one base game box, yeah. alone. Yeah, I don't have any cool. expansions of mine. I still get it to the table, so that yeah. tells you. Oh, yeah. I have like two or three expansions. Haven't played them yet. Haven't needed to. Yeah. I just have them. All right. So the first game I'm going to talk about, and uh, all the games on this list uh, already fall into other categories, but this is where they sing as well. Yeah. This is one, the first one is Cthulhu Death May Die. Okay. Uh, I mentioned it earlier when I talked about game immersion, but there is one standalone expansion, two season box expansions, plus some little mini expansions as you see there. Uh and just out of the base game alone, there is six different scenarios and two monsters that you can integrate as ever, however you want. So the first scenario that we play is where you're trying to destroy the lab, and we did it against Cthulhu. 
but there's also Haster in the base box. And so you're going to be doing the stuff that he deals with as well as the the lab. But there's also five other scenarios in that base box itself. And if you get mm -hmm. some of these uh, mini expansions over here that you see right between uh, Frankenstein there, the Frankensteins, is the fact that you have many monsters expansions that you can integrate with just your season expansions. Um, and you could pick those up on the Seamon store. They're, they're not... Um, hidden behind Kickstarter exclusive stuff. Yeah. Now, there is some of that. I have the Unspeakable box, which is hidden behind the, the Kickstarter stuff. But I have Season 1 over there. I got Season 2 right behind us, that little white box there. Uh, there is a standalone expansion, and then there's also Season 4 that you could pick up all of these things. Uh, so, yeah, it is... It is really neat. There's a lot of integrations just on the expansions, the modularity, and the base box alone. So, yeah, check this one out. Cthulhu. And not to mention, the amount of characters you can play out of the base box. We played four characters, and there is a stack probably of 12 more characters that could have been played. So, And every single one of those characters play differently. Your special ability was you could get a free death. Yeah, pretty <laughs> so much. Yeah. I had a special ability where um, if I went to a certain level, I get to count all my Elder Signs as successes. Or I can um, either heal everybody a health or get myself two health in a sanity kind of thing. So it's just that, that yeah. asymmetrical player power as well as the different boxes. So yeah, replay value of Cthulhu Death May Die. So my next one about uh, replay value is Cthulhu Death May Die. <laughs> for all the same reasons. Yeah. Yeah, just out of the base box alone. Yeah. I mean, like, granted, I only played the one scenario, but, like, I looked in there and I saw, like, all the different packs. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And lots of modularity, and I'm sure people are going to be making custom uh, scenarios, and they make all sorts of different things, fan expansions, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's easy. It's a very expandable game. Yeah, and then, so the next one I guess I'll talk about here is... Arkham Horror LCG. Uh, this one is a bit expensive, though, if you want to go through the entire cycles. However, it is possible. And the, the big thing of what I like about what they're doing now with the LCG mm -hmm. is that they are just releasing the campaign cycle. So if you don't want to get characters, you know, you just want to play the story, yep. you can play the base box characters throughout the entire story book that you're going through. Uh, I think there's seven... Cycles, I think it's what it's called, which means you can get the story all the way through, but then you also have the ca characters that go with that cycle. And so if you want to buy all those, you can, which allows you to choose different characters to play through the game, as well as different scenarios, different ways to play it. Uh, it is, it's, there is a lot. I have four or five cycles right now. Mm -hmm. I only have two character boxes because I'm like, I played two characters in my first campaign of it. And I'll yeah. play two different characters based on the Dunwich Legacy campaign. So I'm playing, I have played a total of four characters in my campaign. And I've yeah. only played two cycles so far. So there is a lot of uh, scaling well. It plays fine. You can play it as four players. I prefer it at two just because it's quicker turns and it doesn't last as long. Uh, but a minimal number of plays for a full experience, I can do the same scenario over and over again and try different characters and see which ones I like. That is really cool. And the expandability for this game is through the roof. Cool. And that it for you? That's it for me. All right, the last one I'm going to talk about here is Eldritch Horror. You don't like it, but that one has a lot of expandability on there. Uh, like the time it's scaling well. It does not scale well. That's no. the big thing. No. And it does have a long no. time. I, I refuse... But minimum number of plays for the full experience, just out of the base box alone, there's a lot of uh, differences in scenarios and stuff like that. Yeah. As Every well, time you roll the dice, you have no idea what you're going to get. As well as the expandability alone on that one, too. Another one I put down just quickly was Horrified, because uh, the new one, the the Greek, the Greek World of Monsters, because yeah, yeah. it integrates with the Greek monsters, so you can actually combine two base expand or together. So... Mm -hmm. That is really cool. But all in all, these are a lot of games that we have played or at least looked at and know about for you to have an understanding of which one fits you best. But a uh, little quick rundown here of the games that we did not talk about. Uh, we did not talk about A Study in Emerald. I have a pre-order for the new version from Simon. It is kind of like a deduction game as you're exploring. You're trying to find out who are the cultists among you, but they have their own win scenario, but you're all playing... It's not social deduction, which is weird. It sounds like a social deduction, 
But the cultists have their own win scenario as well as the, the other people will have their win scenario. You're trying to weed out the cultists, but you're still trying to make sure you get your win scenario. So it looks interesting. It is a Martin Wallace game, I believe. Uh, the other one here is probably my least favorite Arkham Horror, but if you're really just into wanting to fight the final boss, this is the one for you. It's a quicker version of, say, an Eldritch Horror or an Arkham Horror board game. This is Arkham Horror Final Hour. This is literally the last mm, hour of the game where you're fighting the big bad. It's all it is. The big bad has been brought to our realm, and you need to fight them back and win. It's fine. I just didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. Uh, and then we, we can't mention a Cthulhu Mythos games without talking about the doom that co came from Atlantic City. The basically Monopoly Cthulhu Yeah, game. <laughs> I told my, our, our mutual friend about that, uh, Jim, and he was like, wait, what? I was like, yeah, yeah, it's basically uh, Monopoly, but like... But with, with Cthulhu. With Cthulhu. It was like, Cthulhu Monopoly? I'm like, no, that's the, that's putting it too broadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's... You have to deal with Cthulhu stuff. While still trying while to While be... buying and selling real estate. <laughs> yes. It's ridiculous. All right. And then the re-implementations we have here is we have Munchkin Cthulhu. So if you like yep. Munchkin, there is a Cthulhu version for you, as well as Gloom, as well as Flux. Yep. There is uh, Shea Cthulhu, which is yeah. a Shea Geek. That was random. But, uh, I can see how it would work, though. Have you played Shaggy? Like, yeah, I have played Shaggy, right? yeah. yeah. It, it, no, it works. I'm just like, okay. And then the big thing, too, of course, you have a the obligatory Cthulhu expansion yes. in Smash Up. So there is that as well, which actually is kind of cool because you throw Madness in people's deck, which kind of basically makes it dead in the deck as well. So I like that, but those are everything out there for you if you're interested in games and want a Cthulhu theme on it. They're hard to find, but if you can find them, check them out. But yeah, that's everything I found of Cthulhu. No kidding. <laughs> All right, so we want to thank you so much for tuning in. If you ever want to join us on a live episode of our broadcast, we stream it live at twitch.tv slash everydayboardgames. You didn't have the script up, so I know I'm going backwards. That's all right. And join us like our friends Creative Chaos or anybody else, like I said at the top of the episode. That's why you should join us on the live episode. So you can watch us troubleshoot in real time. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? As well as all video re-uploads and reviews are found on YouTube under youtube.com slash at Everyday Board Games. And if you like what we do, there are three things you can do to help us grow on the platform. Subscribe if you're not, like the video, and comment down below and tell us your thoughts on the subject. Feel free to contact us directly. We have an email account at everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com. And you can contact us whether you want to give us ideas for future episodes, tell us what you thought about certain episodes, or even just reach out to say hi or enter in possible future uh, giveaways. Or you can also contact us or check out our content that we create at Instagram.com slash Everyday Board Games. And speaking of those future contests, wait for the first episode in November to find out more. As well as all audio versions could be found on most podcast platforms under Everyday Board Games Podcast. This includes Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, and Apple. So we want to thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I've been your host, Daniel. And I've been your host, Daniel. And we want to thank you for listening to Everyday Board Games. And remember, every day is a good day for board gaming. <laughs>